Let's see, let's turn that around. Good afternoon, everybody. Uh, we are here today to talk with a childhood friend of mine, but she's more than that. Her name is Christy, here she is. Let's get her. Hey, Spike of All Trades. Hey guys, let me get her. Like, so I send it up, let's see. Hey, Christy. Oh, it worked. <laughs> it How did, it Shay? did. <laughs> I told you it would. I'm like, just, just find my face. I'll be live. Just yeah, press a few buttons and it's good. <laughs> well, how are you doing today, Christy? I'm great, thank you. What a gorgeous day up here in Ohio. How's it, it down is, there? It is overcast and here in Charlotte. Just gloomy, but you know what? It's a good day for a run. It is, isn't it? Always I don't like running in hot run. weather. I'm a wimp. Oh, you're a wimp. You don't like I, that dripping sweat? No, I I literally am like, where's the air conditioning? Where's the fan? It's ridiculous. And I know it is, but it's the truth. So Chrissy, I didn't even get to tee up and tell everybody about you. Yes, they see my write up and I tell everybody glowing things about the people who I get to talk with. But I just wanted to tell you out loud while I tell our audience um, why I wanted to interview you and who you are. So. Yes, I've known you uh, since we were in grade school together and haven't seen each other really since then, which is, that's another long story about how remarkable our junior boarding school was that we have, you know, alumni get togethers from, um, from elementary school, essentially. That's right? really odd. <laughs> right. That's yeah, very right. odd. <laughs> but it's an amazing boarding school. But one thing that I have learned about you over uh, recent time, this pandemic has given us such wonderful time to get to know each other in, um, in greater detail in ways that we have not taken the time to stop and let ourselves be known. And so I learned a little bit about really a lot of the backdrop of the difficulty that you were living in when you came to North Country School. And what is really mesmerizing is the human being that you are right now and how you've, you've gone through all those things. You've taken real, I mean, like there are a lot of things that you told me and I would like it if you would share as much as you feel comfortable, really where places where you had to raise yourself, you know what I mean? And you are an extraordinary mother. You're an extraordinary companion. I can see that you are a partner and a helper and a support network for your husband. I can see that you are that even in your local community. And I remember asking you the other day in the car, like, hey, look, tell me what it is. And you're like, you know what? I, all I know is I want to help people. I want to help people. And that's what you do in your everyday life. And I said, well, that you know what you want to do. You're just figuring out the how, right? And we all actually are kind of figuring out the how. So I just take that. I just started off with that little bit. And I'd like to ask, okay, so one, where are you right now, Christy? Where am I physically or emotionally? Or state-wise, na nationally? <laughs> I, I, am, you I am the east side of Cleveland. So I'm in a little town called Solon. And it's beautiful here. Absolutely beautiful. Really? So yeah. I don't think of Cleveland as a beautiful place. What's beautiful about it? Is it like I know. rolling hills? I wouldn't either. So on the east side of Cleveland, so I went to um, a Catholic school here, and that's where I met my husband in high we'll school. We'll get to that. <laughs> and it was a Catholic school, so I got to wear the skirt, and, you know, you're all cute. And, um, and he always had a tie on every day. And, I mean, you oh. just can't pass that up. So I <laughs> fell in love with him, and we... <laughs> I love it. Cannot um, pass up that time. Mm -mm. Yeah, right. And I, I actually uh, lived at the school. Okay. Um, he was a day student. He lived here in the, you know, in the area. And so he would just drive there every day, where as opposed to I lived in the dorms. Okay. So um, there was the ratio compared to the school that we went to in grade school or elementary school, where e almost everybody, except for a few people, were day students. Right. Our school was mostly... Um, day students and like 20 border students. So we're so, talking about university? I'm talking about high school. Oh, so we're talking about yeah. boarding school, another yep, boarding, boarding school. school. Okay. Yeah. And yeah. then I went away to university. Actually, I followed him to university and then I followed him back here. And this is where we reside now. Because What's pretty about it? 
Oh my gosh. You know what? You're right. The, there's rolling hills and it's just gorgeous. It's horse country. Like oh, we're cool. a little bit in the country and in the city at the same time. Okay. You can't beat it. I mean, you've got beautiful open spaces, an amazing yeah. park system. We have the Metro Parks, which is incredible. That's where I train a lot of my clients. Okay. In our beautiful park system. And so we're um, going to get into that incredible. when you say training your clients. So mm -hmm. Chrissy, what is it that you do? I am a personal trainer, basically, just to put it in one quick statement. Um, uh -huh. In fact, um, let's see, I train really all ages, but I'm an orthopedic exercise specialist. So I tend to specialize with people who have, um, you know, post-surgery or mm -hmm. um, joint issues. Like my knee issue. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, let's work on that, Shay. Yeah, <laughs> I know. I know. <laughs> Oh my gosh. Yeah. Let's it's like do little, something little about that. <laughs> I do need to do something. I know. I hobble. <laughs> As you hobble. <laughs> Once you in a while on my run. You run. I'm like, I'll feel my gait and I'll be like, oh, I feel like a nice little 85 year old right now. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but you still do it. Look at you persevering. So Christy, could you tell us just because I was so intrigued by it. Can you take us back to junior boarding school? So you're a little girl, you're going off to boarding school. Um, and when I say little, we're like nine, 10 years old. So mm -hmm. why were you going to boarding school? And what environment were you leaving? So yeah, so I was actually 11. You were there for a year or two before I was. Yeah, I got there when I was nine. Yeah, which is so, I thought 11 was young. Right. Wow. And so, I thought I was grown. I was like, I got this, mom. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's right. We Isn't thought that we were so mature. We had the world. Um, I was 11 and I was sent away, actually, my, um, pretty much my stepmother the, was the catalyst for having my older brother and me go to boarding school. <clears throat> Um, so you were in the care of your father? I was in the care of my father, um, not my entire life. Like he, well, we, when they got divorced, my mother, my biological mother got custody of us. I think that was more normal then rather than the, the, the back and forth that happens a little bit more now, mm -hmm. but it was just the mom gets the kids. That's how yep. it is. Yeah. The and, courts always favor. They still do. The courts still oh, favor the moms for sure. Do. Yeah, that's so, why I wanted to ask that question because when we were talking, what let me know that something had to be awry was that your father had, you were primarily, it seemed, in the custody of your father. And I was like, why would that be the case? Yeah, so that it's a great question. It's um, so originally going back to when I was, of course, when I was born, my older brother was just, was my mom's son. He mm -hmm. was not, he was not uh, with my dad. My mom oh. had a relationship before she was married okay. before and had my brother. And then it was the two of us with my dad and me and they had, you know, they had me. So um, then they got divorced and my mother took both of us Okay. and lived close to us in Canada. We're from Canada. So we were Canadian we were in Canada. We're, yeah. I'm Canadian. I love it. And, um, so we lived in Canada with my mom and that was, that was pretty much hell. That was awful. Um, mm. So skipping over that, um, we went to, my dad fought for custody mm. and argued and he ended up getting custody of us and adopting my older brother. Because remember, my older brother was from my mom and another man. Okay, I'm gonna be honest with you, that fact I did not know until right now. I knew um, that you and your brother went back to your father, but I assumed your brother was your father's biological son. And when you say to not, you don't have to you, share whatever you want, but I just want to make sure because what my intention is and the intention that I want to set and I want to make sure you know why I love interviewing people and having them share their story is because that connects us. When we hear other people's stuff, 
we invariably see our stuff in their stuff. And when we see our stuff in other people's stuff, it doesn't make us feel alone. We feel more connected, less isolated, because the voice of dissension, the voice that discourages us all, tells us all the same lie. And that is we are isolated, we are alone, and we're not good enough. We're not enough. You're by yourself, you're not enough. So my passion is to refute that lie. You are not alone and you are definitely more than enough. So do you mind sharing a little bit when you just said, you know, it was hell, that's gloss over. What do you mean by that? <laughs> Excuse me. So um, first of all, I love what you say because that's the narrative that I have told myself for many, many years and I've worked very hard to mm -hmm. get over that th that narrative. Yep, it's a um, lie. But it, yeah. So I was, I was, I think two or maybe under two when my parents got divorced mm -hmm. and my brother was four years old or he was six. Mm -hmm. And so that's when we went to live with my mom. Mm -hmm. um, she was very much um, into the wrong crowd. And when I say the wrong crowd, she was very heavily into drugs and we're not just talking you know, taking some marijuana, she would shoot up, she would, she was high and, you know, on cocaine and a lot of other stuff for days. And you guys were in that environment when she was doing this. We were not only in that environment, we were neglected to the point where um, we were taken to parties for days. And this was not just a one time deal. It was constant. We would be taken to parties that would last two to three days. And my brother and I would be in the basement huddling with no food. I'd be in a diaper and he would be taking care of me. No food, no attention. And he would have to go out and steal food for us, which was usually candy bars. I mean, he was six years old. So that's solid food. Yep. Mm -hmm. That's so <laughs> that's solid food. <laughs> that's like carbs, <laughs> you got your protein, you have it all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Mm -hmm. So it was a good choice is what we're yes. saying. Hell he was making over. the best choice. <laughs> yes. So we were, um, and this is horrible. I just want to say like, one, do you remember this? I remember bits and pieces of it. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, yeah. Because I have memories from being two and three. My Do husband you? is always astounded by that because he's like, his first, he's like, I think I, the first time I remember something, I'm like six or I feel like he is big. And I absolutely remember two and three. I, I remember when my mother gave away my, um, my crib and I was like, hello, oh my I'm gosh. trying to sleep in this until Jesus comes. So I'm not sure what you're doing. Yeah. Like I was, I can't I just was, see little Faye. Oh my I gosh, that's fantastic! Yeah. So, well, do you I remember wanted, the feeling or the the vis the visual? I have the visual and the feeling, and I and I also see my behavior. Like I see what I'm doing. Like I'm throwing myself against the wall, and I mean drama <laughs> with a capital D R A M A. I mean like drama. But the reason why I'm bringing that to mm -hmm. um, I, I want to bring that up here to the top is that. I remember that. So I, I want people to really remember, like, we have memories. Some of us do have memories at two or three. And can you imagine the memory of a two-year-old who feels herself in the soiled diaper and knows that the only person who can protect her is her six-year-old brother? I mean, that's, I mean, I think we feel these things deeper when we become parents and when we become grown. I, you know, I, I just had an interview yesterday and one of the things I said in it, and I want to say it again is, it's interesting to me when we become adults and we look back on those times when we were kids, because when we were kids, we kind of think that all adults are good. Although you knowing that all that probably was broken down for you at a very early age that they were not. But I remember feeling like all adults were good. All adults knew what they were doing. And now when you become an adult and you look back at situations that you're in, movies that you watched, parties that you were at for two and three days with people doing significant drugs where they could literally die and your mm -hmm. care and attention is not being cared for. It makes you go, who the hell were these adults who were in charge over me? Yeah. And so where is your father in this? Does he know this is going on at the time? 
So uh, he was hearing bits and pieces from when we would go visit him, probably every other weekend or something like that. Um, and he But he was, couldn't do anything about it? He couldn't just take you up out of that situation? He started to, and it ended up with a final big um, kind of an explosive um, point uh, mm -hmm. A couple of years later, we weren't, we weren't going to school. We weren't, you know, we would go to, we would just show up at school occasionally. Mm -hmm. And I remember being in school being like, I love this place. They're so great. I think it was a preschool. I was like, this is the best place. And it's then, order. It's organized. Yeah. I get fed. They oh my give gosh. me water. <laughs> they have games. They pay attention to you. Yes. It's they love fabulous. You. It's where I learned how to make a snowflake. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> the best that I remember that so well. Yeah. And I loved being there, but I wasn't, well, I wasn't taking, taken there very often. So it was, um, it was a, a gradual thing that my dad eventually ended up building up a case. And mm -hmm. then, and then, but in the meantime, it was, it was awful. It was really hard mm -hmm. for my brother too. My brother went through some awful sexual, mm -hmm. awful abuse that, you know, that only I think really on this drug, you know, induced, you know, mental ill high that my mom would get on. She was just so sick in so many ways with addiction and with mental illness that she, she went there to allow her son to be abused in such a way. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So my, I, when I digress, but my, no, my dad did end up. My dad did end up um, getting, you know, I guess getting custody of us and adopting mm -hmm. my older brother and trying to make a new life for us. Do you think, did your mother, did there ever become a time when your mother was lucid and clear enough to acknowledge what she allowed you and your brother to endure? And I mean, when you told me, you know, the passing around of you guys, you know, um, to grown people, sexual it, it that's it's just it it really breaks my heart it, it really does and so i think did your mother ever have like an acknowledgement like i really effed up i jacked you guys up and you deserved more and i must i'm sorry you would think like i would think that somebody who maybe didn't have the mental issues that she had would have that capability i don't think she had the capability Oh, like I've heard stories about when she was young and they, she got a puppy when she was like, I don't know, six or seven. And she was like indifferent to the puppy. You know how normal people are like, yeah, I shouldn't say normal people. Cause no, we can be yeah, the average person, the, the average, average person, person mm -hmm. would be like interested, yeah. taken. Their heart is just melting because this cute little puppy, right. She didn't want to take care of it. She, there was like this weird indifference. So, I don't know if she had, and later on, it like, sounds like anhedonia, like oh, the, I've never heard of that. yeah, it's the ability to not experience joy. And it's because, and, and it is, it's not a diagnosis, but it is a result of, it's like a, a behavioral result that comes out of significant depression and different other mental illnesses that maybe I don't know the scientific name for it, but anhedonia is one of those things. And one of those things is that people who have anhedonia, they experience life like they're on the outside looking at it and they're not experiencing it. And they are incapable of feeling a sense of like joy, like um, birthday parties, everybody's excited. The person with the anhedonia only knows that they should be excited because they're uh -huh. looking at other people's cues and they're like, oh, I guess I should be excited here, but they don't feel it. They've learned to fit in through yeah, they can learn to acting mm -hmm. almost. They can, but sometimes when they're that age, they don't know how to uh, act it out. They just yeah. are like, um, well, hers was, yeah, hers was a little different. I think she had schizophrenia oh. and bipolar. Oh. Later on, she told me, but she was, she was very smart. She had two oh. master's degrees. She it never has not, anything to do with intellect. But you would think that with all that education, intelligence, mm -hmm. she could understand. And but if the brain's even, not working. Yeah, the emotional part, I yeah, guess. Yeah, I guess it's, it's, the emotion, it's not working. It's just not working. Mm-mm. 
Like, it, I, I think it really doesn't have anything to do with intelligence. I think actually a lot of people with significant um, emotional disorders and um, psychological disorders are highly intelligent, highly, mm. highly intelligent. But it's it's their ability to interface with the larger world around them in a health in a healthy manner and an engaged manner that I think that's where you start seeing the breakdown, right? Yeah. Like the fact that you you're a mom of how many children? Two. Two children. Could you ever see yourself? Could you ever see yourself not being able to like not taking care of your kids and not further, not just not taking care of them putting oh, them me. in harm's you are three children oh, right three yeah children. you yeah i was like you have yeah. three yeah. So, <laughs> but i know she has two but could you ever see yourself with any of your three children not only not taking care of them but putting them in harm's way no right it's so the only really brain that can do that that is, it's broken it's broken yeah. it has nothing right. to do with intelligence it has to be. yeah it it's has just to be. It's, it's broken because I, I i often think to myself if I see someone else's child in hurt, in, in peril, in danger, do you know what my natural instinct is? I need to save that kid. I need yeah. to intervene. I need to take care. So when you see people who's, that is not their nat, there's something amiss. There's something wrong. So I, question here. So I love that you said, you know what, Shay, my mother lacked the capacity. When do you think you realize that my mother lacked the capacity, like she just did not have it? And how did you come to that place? So I came, so she moved back to the States, which is where she was from. And mm -hmm. I didn't see her for years. My dad was very, um, <clears throat> he, he protected us, but he wouldn't shun the conversation if I asked about my mom and he would never speak bad about her. He was, right. it was really great. So I built up this, this desire in my brain that I really wanted to see her over years. I would cry at night holding her picture, thinking she wants me, she, and that's a whole nother story because my stepmother was not caring and loving at all. So I would wait for the mom that I thought might now want me, you know? And at North mm -hmm. Country, at our school, I would cry at night holding her picture, you know, thinking that was around the time where I was like, you know what, that's where it was really bad. Because I missed attention and love from somebody who was just loved, you know, that I was their everything, yeah. right? And- um, But she had never given it to you. No, but I had created in my head that she may, I thought she may be different now. Mm. She, may, she may want me, mm. you know? So I went in soon after that in high school, um, when I, after I met my husband, I said, I'm, I'm going to go visit her. And it took me weeks and weeks and talking to my dad and, you know, just, just talking about it to people. And I went to visit her and it was, it was, um, it was like, it was like, you're expecting just a absolute loving, wonderful reunion yeah you're expecting this reunion that's like amazing and like oh my gosh you know i'm here and we can right. love each other and we can have this amazing relationship look at it and i went there and it was it was horrid it was she she had it that didn't disconnect. line up with the movie it didn't line up with the movie that you had it didn't end up with the movie mm -hmm. yeah yeah you had and, a trailer going through your head what was going to happen you get there and you're like this movie sucks. This movie really sucks. Yeah. 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 So it was, it was, that's, that's where I realized, I think it took me a while, but I was like, mm, this ain't gonna work. And once you realize she lacks the capacity, are you then able to work, work towards or work through forgiveness? Yeah, that's completely, it was forgiveness, but you know, as they say in Al-Anon or um, mm -hmm. AA, you know, you you love but you let go you you yeah. can have that forgiveness but that doesn't mean that you have to bring them into your life that's right, right? they do not have to be friends yeah they do not so have to be safe people to you like you it's 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 a powerful thing to release people from the hatred right mm -hmm. to release them from the expectation and the hope that they could have been anything other than what they were yeah but that doesn't mean you now need to sit down at the dinner table and invite them in because they're not right. safe for you 
Right. You know? Absolutely. Compassion is just understanding the context of people and who they are and how they behave and giving them grace towards that end. But compassion doesn't need to mean that we're best friends. Yeah. 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 And that's it's the so thing. It's, it's the understanding um, that it took a while, but the understanding that like how she just maybe was incapable. Yeah. But the hard part is, do I forgive her? You know, I forgave her for what went on because I've moved on. You know, my brother dealt, my brother dealt with it much harder than I did. Yeah. And he still does. And so that, that part's still hard. It, but. You know what? Pause. What I just really want to emphasize here is the longevity of the decision that we make, the longevity of the repercussions from choices and decisions we make. We're grown. We're, we're in our 40s today. So mm -hmm. I, so I bet your brother is in his late forties, early fifty. You mm -hmm. know, yeah, and yeah, he's early fifties. Yeah, yeah. 50. So er, right. So I'm like, this is incredible that he is a very grown man. I just want to say how important the decisions we make. He's a very grown man who is still suffering the repercussions of choices and decisions his mother made over him. You know what I mean? And it's not to say that. Um, because some people are like, well, you can't use anything as an excuse. It's not about an excuse. It's about context, about understanding why, oh my God. And if I know that a choice that I can make today could affect my child when she's 50, mm. man, I'm going to really work hard on these choices, man. Right? Yes. I right? Think, you know, that's the thing. If, I think safety was the biggest thing. We felt unsafe. Of course you did. that was one of the biggest things, right? Right. That you deal with for the rest of your life. Right. Like, you know, come this time of COVID-19, like I went into um, hoarding mode. I had a plan of setting up, you know, if my house completely gets. Doomsday preppers? Completely. Thank you. That's <laughs> yes. what it was. And I'm like, oh, my God, I'm going crazy. I got seven years you know? in the basement. I got seven <laughs> years. <laughs> <laughs> it's so true. Oh my gosh. I know. Like That's the what zombies are coming and we need to, you know, board up the house. So listen, at least if the zombies come, you will be prepared. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. But you know, a lot of, with, with humor, it's, it's, uh, I'm, I've got a, a husband who's hysterical. So he, you know, he just adds, he just adds that lifted feel to every mood. And I bet that's why you were attracted to your husband. He looked state like the fact that the thing that you described of him in college was his t or excuse me, in prep school was his tie. You know what that tie represented to you? Stability. <laughs> Stability. Oh, Stability and that. organization. You can't have your shit all over the place and putting on a tie. There has to be some order to it. There has to be some direction there. And I bet your beautiful little soul and your boat was longing for that. And you saw that there and he looked like a solid bloke. Oh my that's gosh. Hot. Wow. That's good. It's, and even then the, the, the decisions that people made around us affected you that yours though, here's, this is the, I think the big difference between you and your brother. And I've never met your brother or if I have, I don't recall. I'm sure I met no, him. No, you wouldn't have met him. Nope. Um, you know, Thanksgiving or something. But um, <laughs> the difference is there's some people who can be raised in these environments and they grapple with it and struggle being it kind of their mm -hmm. whole lives. Like mm -hmm. the very thing that raised them and broke them, it will be the thing that they will live a broken life in. Does that mean, do you understand what I'm saying? The same yeah. sort of vessel. And then there's those others. And I think you and I are in that other category. So the fracturedness raises us, it breaks us in ways, and we are determined, we're determined to write a different story. But both could not happen, but for the initial fracture. Mm. You know, like I, I wouldn't be as committed to creating a life of power and value and purpose and interfacing and interacting with people from the same place if I didn't have the wonderful fracturedness that my father left in me like a gaping hole. And so it's interesting how these both things come out of the same broken place. It is. And I, a lot of times I am great, not grateful. I'm grateful for what I've learned. Yeah. 
but I'm not grateful at all for what happened. Correct. That's, that's, that's not accurate. No. But definitely, I mean, so find value in yeah. what we've learned mm -hmm. by that brokenness. And the things that we've done to, and with our conversation, we were talking about, you know, what you did with that gentleman in, in the Bahamas was, was oh. so sweet. And but those little that. things that, that we put ourselves out there because we thought we could help somebody. That's right. Maybe because we saw in them the hurt. Mm -hmm. Yes. We saw in them, you know, some, a need that maybe we felt. That's it. Maybe. But that is it exactly. But it's a hurt that we would be unable to see if we hadn't felt it. And absolutely that's that's what i'm saying so it helps me see you it helps me now now walk past you in the grocery store not giving a damn the hurt can make you care it can make yeah. you care and to your point it's not being grateful for these horrible things but it's kind of using it's not kind of it's using victor frankel's principle you know being able to look at our difficulties and our hardships with a redemptive lens and the redemptive lens is what have i learned from it what have I learned? What have I learned? Absolutely. You know, and, and you have. So now I wanted people to clearly see, like when you were talking about, oh, that was a little, no, it was, it was horrific. What you experienced was horrific and you are a beautiful soul. Oh my God. You for me show that a rose can grow in the middle of asphalt. It can. So now you go into your adult life, you meet your husband. What is the thing that you are, are, I guess what I'm trying to get to is when do you make the decision? Not me. That is not going to be me and not mine. I think that was well, I made that a long time mm -hmm. ago. Mm -hmm. I made that a long time ago. When we started talking about children, for instance, I mean, that it was well, well created before that's the thing i think that i knew i always knew what was right and what was wrong right and i was always for the right like my thought was it's going to be a better day mm -hmm. it's always going to be a better day and so i don't think it was a time that i decided that yeah. you know that i am never going to behave that way i always even with my stepmother we spoke a little bit about my stepmother yeah. and how she she was very, um, she was very cold. She was very, almost like I didn't exist. Yeah. Or there was hostility when I did exist. Right. And even I knew that even though I cried and I would wait for her to come in and say goodnight, it was that nighttime that was awful for me. <laughs> it was uh, that nighttime, nighttime is awful for anybody. The ghosts come so. out at night. Right. They do. they do. Because our brains, the world is quiet. We're silent and we're in that space. Oh my God. And the chatter can get so loud in the uh, silence of night. It, it's, it's hard. It's powerful. hard for anybody who's experiencing anything. That's right. the only time when I would have, well, I would have them during the day, but that's when I would really have panic attacks right in the middle of the night. Right in the middle of the night. Yeah. Yeah. Quietness. Not in the day. Not when things were happening, not when conversations were there, not when I was sitting in rooms with people, but when I was in the most alone time of my existence at night, you're in your bed. Yeah. What else is there? Yeah. And yeah. it's really it created like this feeling like I never want to go to bed because <sighs> that's just, that's not fun. But anyway, so I would create this, you know, I would be so sad, but I knew that that's not what was right. Mm. You know, I knew that kids need love. You knew so, that kids needed love. You knew that they needed someone to put them to sleep at night. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And you know what? When I got the privilege to go to North Country School, our mm -hmm. elementary school, um, which, you know, a lot of people thought, they're sending you away. You know, my dad didn't want, us, want me to go, but my stepmother was just dead set in, in starting her own family. I tell you, I found... I found love and acceptance like I had never known. And I mean, so it just fed in. There's all these little t tidbits throughout my life that just said, this is not how it's supposed to be. Mm -mm. You don't need to treat people like that. There's something wrong with that. So I'm very um, grateful and 
I don't know how my life would be if I thought that that was the way that it was supposed to be. Because that you was know my what? life. You just made me want to ask you a question. So yesterday I had this amazing interview with Mirna Valerio and mm -hmm. something she said in that interview was just amazing. She spoke to the first week when she attended boarding school. She went to the master's school, by the way. Oh um, my gosh. Right? Isn't that crazy? Um, these are schools that you and I would know. Yeah. <laughs> you yeah. know? And um, she recalls that first week and she has like three separate scenarios where she's interfacing with teachers that were transformative and actually set her up for the very life that she's living today. So I want to ask you, do you have a memory, a teacher, an experience that you recall was kind of a pivotal life-changing moment that set you up for the life that you hold now? That's what we were talking about. Because when those moments happen, when they're happening in the happening of them, we don't know that they're going to be that thing. But it's looking back that you're like, oh, my God. When Susan Patno told me I was a little shit, she sent me out for some good stuff. You know? So, like, what is that moment for you? Or do you have an experience, a moment, a teacher, or something that now you look at and you go, oh, my God. That set me up for this. So, when that's interesting because there are a couple moments that I can think of, but I think it was a collective, you know, Let's the first moment that I think of is definitely, um, I was going to say Susan Patno, but she's, it was Susan Lacey. Yes. And she used to hug me at night. Remember we talked about this nighttime. So yeah. she would hug me at night and let me hug her till I would agree to let go which could have gone on for life. <laughs> for me, it was like, let's do, just get cuddled up right here and let me hug you all night. But it was, it was, she was absolutely, and she was, even though it was obnoxiously long, she was very patient with me and understanding that I could hug her as long as I wanted to. And I took advantage of that. Let me tell you, I took advantage Susan of that. Susan Lacey. Yeah, hmm. Susan Lacey. But I think it was a collective. I think when you learn, have to relearn something, um, I thought about this. I'm like, why am I still dealing with some of the things that I dealt with all my life? Mm -hmm. And I think it's just that repetitive, constant acceptance that people have been so kind to give me. Do you have another story? Oh my goodness, do I have, an, I have so many stories. That school that, was wonderful. That was like a pivotal experience that helped you be, I mean, because you were a kid who really desperately needed help, you know, and you needed, you were like cottage, you, you were like um, Swiss cheese. You needed something to fill in those holes. And mm -hmm. I, I'm wondering, and it's clear to me in the life that you're living, that those holes are full. And I want to know what are some of the experiences that helped you fill them? I would say Bonnie Morgan. Um, and once again, this is a collective thing, the acceptance she gave me and she took me under her wing and she helped me create a bond with horses that I wouldn't like, I don't think I would have been able to if, if she didn't allow me the privilege to be with her. She accepted me into her home. Mm. She accepted me. She taught me how to vault on a horse. She, yeah, just amazing. The, um, there was one time that, that her husband, John, remember John, John Morgan. Morgan? Yes. The most manly man in the world to this day. The most manly man, him and his tractor and his shovel. And, yes. you know, always like, God, I got to cut this. wood. <laughs> <laughs> you remember he'd just be chopping wood. And we're like, how do you do yeah. that? Yeah, exactly. I've been working on my piece of wood for 30 minutes over here. You just like swung it in two seconds. <laughs> exactly. Right. We're chipping yeah. away. And he's like, yeah, he's good. He's done this a few times. Yes. Yeah. Car yeah. hearts all day long. That's Absolutely. <laughs> you know, did you ever learn to shave sheep? Yes. There? Yes. Wasn't that crazy? Yeah, it was. I mean, and then that, and not only did we shear the sheep. Shear. Then, Thank you. Yeah. Shear the sheep. But then we would clean the wool and use it and then use it on the looms. Like we would make, we would make thread. You remember that? Mm-hmm. Absolutely. And then all on the loom. I'm In, just like. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> 
it was really good that they made us you know i think at an early age they taught me the connection between the land and what i how i live what i live with what i consume so i i never until i got to north country school i remember thinking chicken where did chicken come from the grocery store that's where chicken came from it came from the grocery store yeah you know where where did the things that we wore and our clothing the the where did it come from the store it came from macy's mm -hmm. it came yeah. from bloomingdale's that's where it came from <laughs> you know um but north country school taught me like oh everything that we are everything that we consume at its core it comes from the earth it comes from the earth Absolutely. so what you gonna do you gonna treat it well you yeah. gonna be appreciative so now i see what it takes to get like a wool sweater that's a damn good wool sweater <laughs> you know <laughs> that's your that sheep gave its entire wool coat <laughs> you know what i mean that it grew your, all year. Your poshy sweater, you know. Right. It doesn't mean that you don't enjoy the poshy sweater. It's now you enjoy it more deeply and more profoundly yeah. because yeah. you know where it comes from. Absolutely. You know, it, life always requires life. Something has given us a sacrifice in order for us to enjoy what we enjoy. Absolutely. And North Country School gave us that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was. So, go ahead. Yeah. No, it was definitely a collective, beautiful educational experience that really helped me and I always say it was the best school I've ever been to. Me too. So yeah, because is, of that. Is there any great book right now that you can say, you know what, this was a great book or a great lecture or a great anything that also inspired you in your life and helped you on the footing that you are in right now or on oh right now? So I love that question. Well I'll tell you what I'm reading now. I live very much in the moment. Give it let's do it. I'm reading <laughs> and it's taken me a long time to get through. There's so many good things that I just want to keep Ooh, Ooh I in. want you to tell us some stuff. I know it. Well, it's a seven decisions. I don't know this one. Oh my gosh, you don't know this one. Where is it? It's, uh, this, I think it's the same author as The Traveler. Is Ooh, right? so yeah. what is it about? And, why, and what is it speaking to for you? Oh my goodness. So it's really about understanding, like, like kind of getting over yourself and getting moving on what your dreams and goals are. And that's absolutely where I'm at. Like, let's, let's get over this narrative that I've had mm -hmm. for years and that I've created in my head. And um, let's put that aside and let's look at some great leaders and how mm -hmm. they handle life and learn how to live life. Because I'm not kidding you when I say there's, I just, I feel like I don't know how to manage my life sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I'm really having to learn good habits and ways to organize my life as a mom, especially. Yeah. Like I never had a mom that told me how to do things like, yeah, like be okay with getting the kids up and changing their diapers. And I was and doing all these things. And I was like, is this what I'm supposed to do? Yeah. Like, I don't know what you're supposed to do as a mom. Yeah. And, you know, even as a mom of older kids now, I've got 21, 17 and 14, you know, I'm really learning just how to organize my life and how to understand it and how yeah. to be okay in it. I was always restless and I've always been that way because I didn't know what, I didn't know what I'm supposed to be doing. Where, mm -hmm. what, who am I? You know, um, that's. Kind what of do weird, you think really. you are here for? Mm. I love that. You know what? I still am learning that, but I tell you what I do know. I do know that I feel good when I help someone else see life differently. And I think that's what I do in my life. I think that's, that's what makes me feel good. And so mm. that's what I do. Mm. Because I do feel like I have a different perspective than other people and they have a different perspective than me. And that's if you right. can share that, boy, does it ever feel good to feel like enlightened myself Yes. as well as help someone else understand themselves mm. or what's going on or who they are. And I don't know. Do you think that's what led you to orthopedic specialty that you're in um, with exercise? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It started with therapy in college and, you mm -hmm. know, masters of therapeutic arts and um, really 
really that it's always been part of me is that I've always really enjoyed uh, helping other people live better in some way mm. and see that there's more, there's more to life, no matter where you are and you think you've achieved it all, or you think maybe you haven't achieved everything and anything. And this is where we are. There's always more, there's more. If you're in the deepest love of your life and you think, gosh, I know everything about this person, just like with There's my no husband, one. there was a point where I was like, I know everything about him. I don't know why, I, like, this is it. And then he said to me, he looked at me and he said, Christy, there's more. There's more. We have so much more mm. to learn about each other. And I thought, that's it. Yeah, there's more. I love that. For everybody. There's more. Wow, Chrissy, I'm like, I don't even know what to do. Um, the next thing I want to ask you is, is there a great movie that you have seen as of late that you, or over the course of your life that just speaks to you and encourages you, inspires you or lifts you? Absolutely. If so, what is it? So it's a little bit controversial, but I do love The Greatest Showman. Oh, it doesn't why, sound controversial. Why is I'm, it? Why is it controversial? I, I'm so I might be ignorant. Uh, I believe that because the, he's treating animals and stuff like that. Or? Because the whole circus issue. Yeah, right. it's not. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I remember. Yeah, but we can extrapolate redemption, yeah. redemption, and everything. We can find the redemptive line. Yeah. Absolutely. And, and what movie, is it about it? Oh, that movie is so uplifting. It's a. It's basically about a man who everybody told him he couldn't do what he. What he wanted, to, you know, he wanted to help others. And, um, you know, of course, he wanted to make money off of it as well and have a beautiful life and a beautiful family. Mm -hmm. But, boy, the, the, the way that he pulled people in who really didn't have any, their, their talents and their, um, who they were was not being appreciated. And yeah. it was just... Like oh, the really? freak show. He, he made the freaks. Show. I know a little bit about it. He was like, did you oh, see the we... movie? No, I've never watched it. And I know to the much chagrin to my best girlfriend, because she, she sent me the soundtrack. She's like, oh my God, this song, this is the, uh... and it really was an amazing song. <laughs> so now you have to see it. So I you know do. I'm going to be on you it. about that. You have to take the time for sure. I, I do. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. So Christy, what would you say has been one of the greatest I guess, lessons that motherhood has taught you? Oh my gosh, what a wonderful question. Motherhood. It has taught me that my kids, our kids, if we believe in them and we love them and we listen to them, I think think that's the key to helping them grow it's and it's helped me I need to be you know patient and understanding and listen to them and it's helped me be much more patient look at life happier even if they're down I have to look at the bright side you know mm -hmm. um, that's definitely definitely humor is so important to keeping a family together. <laughs> oh my God, it is. Um, but really listening, I, you know, and that's where I think I can make the, the right of the, my dad is a very good listener to me and it really helped me on so many levels. So many, he'll just listen to you talk every day for an hour, whatever, however long it takes. And I think that that's really helpful to help let them, you know, really Process. work through what they're, what they're developing in their head. Yeah. I'm still developing. <laughs> so am I. So am I. Yeah. yeah Chrissy, we all are. I have a couple more questions. Yes. Tell me this. Um, I so I used to really love this show called Inside the Actor's Studio with James Lipton. And he would always end his interviews with these questions. And you know, I've added to them and stuff, but I'd like to ask you some of those questions. But the before I get to those questions, I would like to say what is it that you hope this interview accomplishes? 
what is it that you hope people are able to take away? Wow. Oh, that's a great question. I really wanted from this interview just to shed light that perseverance, that there's positive, there's, there's more, there's more, no matter where we're at, there's more. Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I, I can't say it more simple I than that. I think it's that. perfect. It really is. And it's just a matter of getting from one side to thinking that we're stuck in our beliefs and our, in our ways. And this is the life, our jobs, mm -hmm. our place, our, our mental status, mm -hmm. you know, like where we're at in our, where we're thinking and really just get to the other side that there's so much, uh, we can really break through and do really listen to ourselves. Yes. But that doesn't have to be the narrative for the rest of our life. Ooh. Yeah. Whatever narrative we had does not have to be the narrative for the rest of our life. It doesn't have to be. It, it can be, of course. It, but it doesn't have beautiful, to be. Beautiful, but it doesn't have to be. Mm -hmm. Yes. So, Christy, what sound or noise do you love? Oh, my gosh. My family laughing laughing belly laughing complete wholeheartedly where you can't catch your breath and there's that little sound coming out because you're laughing so hard and all that's coming out is that little squeak oh i just snorted uh, yeah um i totally just did a uh, oink, oink, snort yeah i love that type of laughter too and it feels so good where you almost feel like you're choking like you can't even get your next breath of air and you're like stop don't do it. one yes. more thing. <laughs> right. Does it all just kill me? Yeah. I know. Oh my God. I just saw something that made me feel like that. What sound or noise do you not like? Oh. Raised voices. Ooh. Takes you back. Yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Raised voices. It's, it's not productive at all in any way. Mm-mm. I mean, I'm not, not to say I've never done it. Oh, I, I my go voice there and I'm like, what am I doing? <clears throat> right. I'm like, what am I doing? That's no. Not... But I'm still in it. Like, wait a second. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Because we got to make a point. We got to make a point. That I'm right. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Hello. But it's a horrible sound to hear. <laughs> it, it is. It is a great one. You're right. What's your favorite word? Oh, boy. Mm. There's so many. Anything positive, flourishing. I love looking up, uplifting, breaking through, mm. um, achieving, striving. All those words that deal with. Mm -hmm. mm. Just feeling going to the other side, breaching. Yeah breaching the limitations it, it feels good to, those words even sound good they do yeah that's mm -hmm. when i think we're in our best flow is when we're like <laughs> going Break on through to the other side hello james morrison how are you doing <laughs> <laughs> jam session after this <laughs> right <laughs> um oh jeez. what if heaven exists I was thinking about asking another one, but I'm like, no, I'm going to ask this one. If heaven exists, what do you want God to say when you get there? Mm. I'm bringing all your family and friends. I'm bringing all your family and friends. I love it. Mm -hmm. All of them are coming up. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh. Gosh, I love it. So Chrissy, you and I are both in the middle of our house, right? We know what we're here for. We're helping people. And I just want to encourage people as they are figuring out their how. That's kind of what we all are doing. Does it feel good? I'm enjoying it. Absolutely. Absolutely. It feels yeah. so great. Yeah. The unknown of it. You know, like, 
I like the unknown. I like that I don't know exactly what's around the corner. That's what makes it exciting. But it's good mm -hmm. because there's always more. Oh. That's what you taught me. Beautiful. Thank you so much, Christy. Oh, I appreciate you, you giving me this time and, uh, and sharing this vulnerable space in your process because that's where we all are. I'm grateful. Thank you for your time, Shay. Thank you. I love you, Christy. I love you too. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs>